Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And as promised, we are beginning to talk about Rome today, um, the legendary founding, plural. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Uh, should we should we just start there? Um, sure. Who All wants right. to tell the story of Troy? Well, Troy fell. <laughs> That's the most <laughs> important thing you know. The Trojan horse was actually a Greek horse. Yes, um, <laughs> it was full of Greeks. Um, you know the fun fun fact about um, the the Iliad, which is the story of the fall of Troy, is that it is the story, quite literally, if you translate the title, it is the story of Troy. Uh, Ilium was the the name of the city, and Iliad means the story of the city. So, if we were to translate it properly, it would be called Troy Story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you do not have a friend and horse. <laughs> no, so, the horse is full of Greeks. Okay, and to so, remind ourselves of history, when do we say that the fall of Troy happened? Because <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> or is depends. there a date? Well, there are multiple dates. Okay. Um, the um the one that i remember seeing most recently is more or less in the time of the judges but oh, well, that's early uh it might have been as late it might have been later and i would have to go back and look at my notes on greece to find the other alternate dates uh, i don't know about you growing up as a small kid i was had the feeling that it happened in Mythical times, <laughs> which are not unlike Bible times. In fact, in Xena Princess Warrior, they often intersect. Overlap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was it was a long time ago when these kind of things happened. Actually, it wasn't that far back. And if it's um I'm back to I think I always think of well, Homer wrote the story, so my brain kind of puts it with him, but I'm pretty sure he, well you're right. He's and he retelling. wrote it, he's his writing, this has been something that scholars have debated. Did he write, you know, a long, long time collecting oral tales, or did he write it within the lifetime of the people who fought, or at least of their children? Um, and, and that does move the date around a lot. Because I believe they have found evidence of the actual city of Troy and its destruction, correct? Archaeologically? That's my understanding. So they do it. In theory, they have things, but that doesn't mean they can date them. Uh, traditional chronology places the Trojan War about 1200 BC, which is about the time of Israel's judges. Um, uh, Kerville's reconstruction places it much closer to the founding of Rome. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Rome uh, was founded in 753 BC. At least which would again, be a little before the people of Israel went into captivity with Assyria. Mm -hmm. right. So roughly around that time. Yeah. So that's that's a temporal context. Um, this, do you want to continue with the story of the Aeneid? Because it, it has... Who is this Aeneas guy anyway? <laughs> and what does he have to do with Troy and with Rome and all that? Please continue, Emily. I interrupted oh. you and got us on this little side lane. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Aeneas is a, a a refugee from Troy, essentially. Uh, the legend, as Virgil tells it, many centuries later, <laughs> <laughs> is that Aeneas escaped from the ruins of Troy as it was falling, and he carried on his back his aged father and the idols um, that had failed to protect Troy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so already off to a great start. Um, he is known as Pius Aeneas in uh, Virgil's Aeneid, um, indicating that he is held in great reverence by all the Romans who followed. Um, it's My memories of the Aeneid are not the most precise. It was never my favorite book. Um, Mine either. E yeah. Um, but we can also... We also need to remember that what we have about Aeneas from the Aeneid is largely political propaganda <laughs> um, <laughs> because Virgil was writing to uh, curry favor with the Caesar of the time. Who, so, was, Ag who was Augustus. Augustus, right. So, um, yeah, Pius Aeneas, he is the 
the one credited with being the ancestor of the city of Rome, uh, even the ancestor preceding Romulus and Remus, who we should get to next. Yeah. Um, all right. So quick filling in of details, depending on who you believe in, how pro-Roman you are, because you're right, it's a piece of political propaganda. Uh, Aeneas is looking at Greece and saying, hey, they have these two great epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Iliad and Odyssey. What if we had ours? And using those two books as a template and reversing the order, he comes up with Aeneas fleeing the ruins of fallen tree. Aeneas is a prince of the city, a son of Venus, Aphrodite. Um, and the first half of the story is him explaining how he got not to Rome. He's on his way to Rome. Lots of things happen, just like they did to Odysseus uh, in the Odyssey. But he gets blown off, of course, and ends up in Carthage, which is a Phoenician uh, colony. Where he ran into Dido. To Dido mm -hmm. or Dido, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, and the gods who oppose him make him fall in love with her or her with him, trying to stall him because Juno, who is the great goddess behind all this, hates the Trojans, and then it goes all the way back to the judgment of Paris when Paris wouldn't vote for her as the most beautiful goddess in the world. <sighs> so uh, Jupiter has to prod him along by the hand of Mercury, and with great sadness and heartbreak, he leaves Carthage, and Dido begs him to stay, and he won't, and it's it's me, isn't it? No, and it's me. I just have this <laughs> destiny because I'm pious, and the gods have told me I got to go do this stuff. And so she commits suicide on a pier with Aeneas' own sword and burns herself. And in the distance, Aeneas sees smoke rising and says, that can't be good. <laughs> and the second half of the book then is he ends up in, um, in Italy. And there's a war that's sort of like the Trojan War, but he wins and he marries the local king's daughter. And these local people are called Latins. And he's the one thing that Juno gets out of this deal is, but the Latins are my people. They, these, these newcomers have to take that name and use that language. Okay, dear, whatever you say, Juno, or <laughs> Jupiter says. Um, and then depending upon timelines and interpretations and such, one of his descendants becomes the ancestor of the Roman people. Now, let me let me actually. I looked at this earlier, and of course, short term memory and all that. It went right out of my head. Um, from Aeneas's line come two children, Romulus and Remus, and here is the story: the uncle Amulus seized his brother's throne, slew his sons. Then, to avoid the possibility of future offspring, he forced his brother's only daughter, Rhea Silvia, to come a, become a Vestal virgin, a priestess to Vesta. Virgin, no ch children. But she is raped by a stranger who she later claimed was the god Mars, because that makes it better. And she gives birth to two children, who she names Romulus and Remus. But Amulus, the wicked uncle, because it's always the wicked uncle, right? Throws <laughs> the children into the Tiber. That's a river. But they survive and are rescued and suckled by a guess what? A wolf. A wolf, a she wolf. Of or, course. According to um, the historian Livy, Maybe a shepherdess named Lupa, because that would explain that. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a wolf. It was a human being <laughs> named Wolf. <laughs> wolf. Well, there's, it'd be another word actually, but never mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> female. Okay. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> a feminine wolf. <laughs> a feminine wolf. Grew up to avenge, they, the children grew up to avenge the family, and then they decide they're going to start a new city because that's their destiny and all that. And they they debate who the city should be named after because you don't name it after just one, two people. You, know, you have to pick one. Yeah. And as they're uh, thinking this over, Romulus begins to plow the sacred um, grid that will represent the walls and the moat. Uh, and Remus scoffs at this and jumps over and says, see, that's what I think of your walls of your holy city. And Romulus kills him and says, thus shall it always be to those who defy my walls. And so the city will be called Rome because the city of Reem just... It just doesn't have the same name. <laughs> no. Holy Reman Empire, Holy <laughs> Reman Church, you know, it just, it would not have worked. <sighs> 
But this does bring us to a more serious note about Rome. We often hear about how important the family was to Rome. And it was one of the social blocks, one of the things that cemented the society together, to be sure. However, it was never primary. Mm -hmm. uh, notice we're, we're starting with a man who, uh, who, by the gods, is forced to abandon his land, his people, his family, carries his father, but his father dies before they've hardly gone anywhere. Um, he has a wife and a son, but they get lost in the story, and he ends up, the whole goal is that he marries somebody else. And then almost the whole family dies, apparently, along the way, and we have a wicked uncle who tries to do nasty things to his niece, and then it just goes, and then we have a brother murdering a brother. This over is not the a the sanctity of the walls, no less. Yeah, over yeah, over the city, which is not even occupied yet. Now, remember that when you created a city, this was a magical and a religious act. Yeah. Something that our secular society really doesn't get. Uh, we, we look at this, and it's just a, it's, a, it's a city. It's a religion. Um, and it's built on the blood of Remus. So this is all significant. The next thing is that Ramos at this point does not seem to have a wife, nor does he have any citizens. And so he opens the gates of his city, as it were, to shepherds and brigands and bandits and pirates and wanderers and vagabonds and whoever wants to come in. This is not a city uh, in the Greek tradition where it's all built around family and the worship of a common ancestor. And most of these people who are coming in are males. And so they have a problem. <laughs> problem like the Benjamites had at one yeah, point. <laughs> exactly like that. Or seven brides for seven brothers. Right. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> the more, so, the, the uh, softer version of those stories. Yeah. <laughs> Them sobbing women. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Sabine women. <laughs> they, um, the Romans invite... Uh, the residents of a local city to come and party with them, and they do. Yeah, but all the men apparently get so drunk that they go home not realizing that half their people are missing. That is all of the women. And they turn around the next day and come back and say, hey, we want our girls. And the Romans say, no. And the girls say, but daddy, I love him. And they <laughs> agree to let the girls stay. And thus, Rome is... Um, Peopled. Peopled, yes, the world must be peopled. It is interesting if you uh, look up the rape of the Sabine women, mm -hmm. how little actual information there is and how much <laughs> art comes up. Because <laughs> I was going, okay, I want to know more about these details and where they're coming from. I got one, I think it was Wikipedia, and everything else was, here's a piece of art, here's a piece of art, here's a piece of art. So I don't know exactly why, but it's been very popular to... To, to make artwork about it captures the imagination. I don't, uh, yeah, it's statues, <laughs> paintings, uh, musicals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So I don't know why, as such a small blip in history, it's made such an impression on artists. But. The um, the books that I've read over the years have suggested that rape in this context probably meant the word itself meant capture. That does not, however, mean that once they captured them, nothing they happened. Not them. Yeah. <laughs> they did They sat back and watched anime all night or something. Um, <laughs> other things were going on here, uh, and, but somehow the, the men managed either to win the hearts of the women, which is the story that Rome put out, or to be a big enough military threat that dads and brothers backed off and said, well, we lost that one. So anyway, that's that's that. Now, shifting, uh, Romulus becomes the first king, and upon his death is deified. But we need to look for a moment at Roman religion. We, backing up, the Romans, like the Etruscans before them who lived in Italy, and the Latins, and then going eastward, like the Greeks, these were all sons, descendants of Japheth. And their religions were all very similar, and everything we've said about the Greeks pretty much applies to the Romans. You worship your ancestors, um, and you worship the magical power inherent in common things and common natural operations. It's animism. 
Uh, but it's animism where everything has its God, its spirit. We should not necessarily exactly think of personal gods. Thinking of um, Star Wars and the Force is probably more to the point. <laughs> uh, you can tap the power in anything. You can use the power in anything if you know the magic words. And so homes, families had their gods, their spirits, their forces. Uh, the greatest was the uh, hearth fire. And generically, it was called Vesta. Eventually, Vesta became a feminine deity, very powerful in the Roman pantheon. Uh, but the, the lintels and the threshold would each have its spirit. The planting of the corn and the growing of the corn and the budding of the corn and the harvesting of every, every process, every act of nature was a divine act. And if you treated the gods, the forces well, they would be propitious. The, they were guardians of the, uh, the storage cupboards and just all, all of the gods everywhere. Gods galore. Yeah. We should maybe talk just briefly about the hearth fire. Because mm. I, I think it's easy to miss the significance of that in a day with central heating. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the hearth fire is what causes a home to be functional. Yes. Uh, you have fire for heat, for cooking. Everything that you want a home to do requires a hearth. Um, I, I mean, it's the same reason that the Amish don't have central heating, <laughs> because it forces them to gather as a family around the fire. Mm. Um, and that's, it's easy to dismiss that as like a little thing of, oh, the Romans had a God for every little thing. They did. But notice that this is something that's very uh, magical yes. in that it causes a home to be. And the father is the priest of the hearth fire, uh, and he knows the magic words that keep the fire doing what the fire is supposed to be doing. And so, as in Greece, the father and his direct lineal descendant um, become the the trunk, uh, the root and the trunk, and then lead onto the branches of this tree that is family. Interfering with that, the wife committing adultery. Uh, sons, not, not having sons in the first place, sons rebelling and moving, all that's really, really bad for the family. Uh, and, and so it's important that the father pass to the son the exact words and language of the incantations. They did not necessarily mean anything. You know, if we were, if when we speak in English, even even when a family has been out of true fellowship with the Lord for a long time, they will still have their oftentimes their little prayers. They will teach their children because you know you teach your children to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep, Father. Thank you for this food. You know, things like that. They're still in English, and we still know what the words mean. Yeah, in even Jerome, even in Harry Potter, we yeah <laughs> we distort the Latin to make it sound like it should mean something. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, one of my joys reading Harry Potter is I know enough Latin to say, that's not Latin. I don't know what you're doing there, but that's <laughs> it's obviously not even a spell. But in in Rome, in Roman civilization, they were words. They were syllables. You had to pronounce them very carefully because the demonic forces behind these gods delight in wreaking havoc with the human mind and keeping men afraid that they're going to screw up, making them walk the fine lines of uh, insane detail just because <laughs> it's fun. I um, had a friend in college who had a word. I don't remember what the word is, which brings me grief. Mm -hmm. But for when you accidentally misspeak while you're singing a hymn in church and it makes mm. it heretical. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done that. We've all done that. And guess what? The Lord knows what we meant because <laughs> he's... A personal God. Yes. <laughs> and he's merciful. <laughs> and merciful. And it's not it's not about the mechanical movements of your mouth. No. Uh, the ancient demons were not so. No. Mm -hmm. Speaking of our God's mercies, far more common than misspeaking into heresy is not paying attention at all to what we just said. Mm -hmm. I, I have been guilty of this a lot. I've noticed it a lot lately. Like, Okay, I'm. A, I, I remember the first verse, so I think we're on the fourth now. I will now quickly look at the screen and see what it is I just <laughs> said, because it's probably important. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. All right. I'm now I'm now more edified. <laughs> wasn't really paid attention to the Lord while I was talking to him. That's not not, not a good thing. Uh, something that eventually, well, a couple things that come with this. One, a lot of these powers were seen not simply in individual operations, but in the operations of whole groups of people, like the state or the family, or the priesthood. And we begin in Rome to get something that they called colleges, which meant collections. That's from collecto, a Latin word that means to draw together, to collect, to speak together. Um, the colleges of priests, we have the College of the Vestal Virgins, who represent Vesta. Uh, so it, religion is becoming institutionalized. It is moving from just what people do in the privacy of their home to shaping social institutions. That's important. And of course, the city of Rome, again, from the beginning, had been a religious institution. Something else that goes with this is the idea that ways of living, modes of living, are also representative of divine forces. You mentioned Aeneas's piety. Piety is actually one of the classic virtues. It's an expression of the magical or divine forces that work in the universe that humans should seek to pursue and uh, embody and live out. There's there's a list of them. I'll, I'll just read some of these. They mostly speak for themselves. Piety, grav gravity, which means seriousness, <laughs> discipline, industry, hard work and diligence, clemency, forgiving people, giving up your rights for practicing mercy, virtue, which meant manliness, strength, power, frugality, living a simple lifestyle, this was important, as late as some of the Caesars who lived very simple lifestyles just to make a point of how virtuous or frugal they were. And this is important because as the Republic, we pass through the kingdom, we pass in the Republic, the Republic begins to fade. Forever, we finally come to the empire. The writers are pointing back to ancient Rome, to semi-mythical times, and saying, oh, if only we had the virtues of our fathers. <laughs> and, and these are the kind of virtues they were talking about. The question for us as Christians has got to be, all right, first of all, let's, we, we could admit that most of these things have some vague correspondence to Christian virtues. They're not exactly the same, and each one has a precise definition that may catch us off guard. But at least superficially, we can say, all right, that... Family values, we would have said a generation <laughs> ago. <clears throat> so that, but then the question becomes whether they simply valued these things but never really lived them, or whether, in fact, for a generation or two, they did live them. The question becomes why? And what did they mean by them? What did they mean by them? But where did they get the ideas? Mm -hmm. Because at this point, this, this is fairly late in human history. This is a huge dose of common grace, any way you look at it. Even mm -hmm. simply to know, this is how we should be living. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be killing people. We should be forgiving people. We should be working hard at our jobs. You know, those kind of things, you go into other parts of the world, and there are whole civilizations that don't believe this. But the Romans either did or pretended they did or wanted to believe that they did. Where did that come from? And this would be the time to, again, consult chronology as best we can and say, is there, is there a Hebrew influence at work here? Did, did these people for a short time have some kind of contact with the Bible? Is there some reason we should expect that they would have some understanding of these things? There's no other, <laughs> short of God intervening, there's no particular reason they should. Because mm -hmm. I mean, remember, we're way after the Trojan War. We're, we're not far from Homer and, um, and Hesiod, and so we're not far from the, um, the Greek philosophers. Why did the Romans value these things? Uh, now, if we look at Israel's history, we can look backward and we can look forward. If we could look backward, we have Solomon and his navies sailing the world and probably interacting, and then the whole world coming to Solomon's court to hear his wisdom. So there's one huge explosion of common grace of God's word reaching out and having some sort of effect in the world around it. Um, later on, going forward in Israel's history, 
were not apparently to the time of um, the fall of Israel and then later the fall of Judah, although we're awfully close. Uh, was there something there? Or were people, as things got bad in Judah and Israel, did people start leaving? Uh, how is it that this happened here? And there has not been anything like enough serious historical work on the part of Christian historians to try to come up with answers like that. Uh, we we do have books as early as the Church Fathers asking, did Plato read Moses? And this is earlier. So questions left unanswered. When we get to the Roman laws, the uh, the Roman law was eventually written down at the insistence of the lower classes. Here are some of the things that are there. If a man has broken or bruised a freeman's bone with his hand or club, he shall undergo a penalty of 300 pieces. If it's so slaves, 150 pieces. Uh, if any person who destroys by burning any building or heap of corn deposit alongside a house shall be bound in scourge and put to death by burning at the stake, provided he's committed the said misdeed with malice aforethought, but if shall, he shall have committed by accident, that is by negligence, it is ordained that he repair the damage, or if he be too poor to be competent for such punishment, he shall rece receive a lighter punishment. If a theft has been done by night, if the owner kills the thief, the thief shall be held to be lawfully killed. Those are all, that last one especially, almost verbatim from Moses. Mm -hmm. How did they know? Where, where, what's the connecting link? And of course, the, uh, the liberal answer is, well, the redactors of the Old Testament who lived after Ezra no doubt had some intercourse with this, as they did with the Code of Hammurabi, and they just stole from the pagans because it sounds good. No, that's not the, the timeline, though. Uh, if there's borrowing, the 12 tablets are being are borrowing from Moses. If so, how, why, when, under what circumstances? Marvelous questions that apparently the Church Fathers didn't know the answer to. Uh, oddly enough, we probably have more access to more documents than they did. And ours are all computerized. We have search functions. <laughs> we just need to start using them and seeing what we can come up with. I'm wondering if this kind of, this demonstrates some, though, of our presuppositions in the modern enlightenment thinking because they looked back to the Romans as a great source of uh, what we would say kind of neutral reasoning, uh, yeah. rationalism, and those sorts of things, which as we're describing them, obviously they're not, but there was a lot of looking back to Greek and Roman ideas in the 1700s and simultaneously elevating a lot of these virtues for their own sake because they rationally looked good and like the right way to live. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of an interesting thought of they looked back and saw the Romans upholding these things and because of their presuppositions, didn't look for any Christian influence. They just assumed, oh, they rationally figured it out, just like we are rationally figuring it out, because yeah. we're ignoring all the influence of Christianity on us, and they then ignore it on the Romans, too, or any um, more ancient civilization. Now, I do want to put a, put a little bit of a curb um, in that we we do need to be cautious of doing history by deciding what happened and then going back and looking for evidence. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's not what we're advocating here. <laughs> no, it, it's um, more just an interesting um, similarity that I saw. I was like, oh, those are right, really similar course. virtues to what Enlightenment thinkers said. Yeah. Oh, we can figure these things out just by, you know, thinking in our own minds. And they ignored other influences from religious sources. Yeah, right. a couple of things along those lines. Yes, we don't, we, we cannot create history through our questions, but we can have questions. Mm -hmm. And once we understand uh, on a biblical basis that man is not naturally good, that he does not naturally uh, create value or live out the precepts of Scripture, we should raise the question of, then what happened here? Are we misunderstanding it? Does it just look good? Uh, is there an is there a source of what people, theologians often call common grace, uh, overflowing of God's goodness into other cultures because of the presence of His Word and of His servants, or is it something else? It's it. Th this is why this is one of the reasons we study history is to ask the questions of why did this happen? Mm -hmm. What can we learn from it? But in this case, we're looking at something that is clearly in accordance with 
the words that God spoke to Moses. Yeah. Um, and asking, how did this get here? <laughs> it doesn't spring up from nowhere. It doesn't come so that's, from nowhere. that's what we're doing. We're not, uh, we don't want to be deciding the verdict before we start the trial. No, and when But I'm when we look at something that exists somewhere else, we can ask, how did this get from A to B? <laughs> yeah, and you both know the story of Peace Child. Uh, mm -hmm. It is possible that that was a direct steal. It's also possible that it wasn't, mm -hmm. that somehow human consciousness imprinted it as, as it is with the image of God came to, well, we know that all those other cultures came up with the idea of child sacrifice as a way of maintaining peace with the gods and with one another. Was that all a remembrance of um, Genesis 3.15 and the sacrifice lamb? Or was it just what is in the human heart? God has set eternity in their hearts. Um, Don Richardson has a book by that title that goes along with Peace Child. Um, and so again, this is where we begin asking questions. And that's what I'm suggesting that we start at some point, probably right now, not now, because we got better things to do right now, but at some point <laughs> along the line, maybe historians in a couple hundred years when computers are better and we have more things committed to databases, start using those search functions to see if there are connections and maybe believe that our ancestors, although certainly sinful as we are, were not therefore necessarily stupid about everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that some of the things they said might actually bear some investigation. Um, anyway, there's a whole, all kinds of things we can talk about in, in, with regard to the philosophy history. The other thing that, that Rachel mentions, and I was just about to get there when she took what she thought was a tangent and isn't. <laughs> um, those, yeah, you, you spoke of discovering the virtues. Roman education was very limited Fathers taught their sons. There wasn't. There weren't generally schools. Formal education, as we think of it, was not something they prized. Fathers would teach their sons to read so they could read the law. But an awful lot of Roman education was fathers telling their sons stories mm -hmm. about the great heroes of the past and how they behaved virtuously. Um, the the um, man was at Cincinnati who refused to receive the office of dictator until he was properly draped in his tunic, the, the robe of office, because you have to do these things right and officially. The man who is Horatio, who holds the bridge mm -hmm. um, against the a incomers. Brave and, Horatio. <laughs> yes, and then cuts it and falls into the, into the stream below in the ravine and saves. It, it, these kind of stories were very common and... I ran into them in my own education in two ways. One, McGuffey's readers. Mm. McGuffey's readers were America's attempt to present a Christian education without Christ. They wanted to present virtues, but they didn't want to appeal to Scripture because if we talk about the Bible, we all disagree and we're all different churches or lack of churches as the case may be in the case of some of the deists and Unitarians. But then the Unitarians had their churches. So you know, we, can't, we can't go there because we all disagree about the Bible and we... So let's find other sources of virtue. Oh, the Roman stories. So McGuffey's readers is rather full of those. When I started learning Latin, which I think was in fifth grade, and they we got past the um, see the girl, the girl has a frog, the girl shows the frog to the sailor. Once we got past those stories, instead of actually reading um, something akin to Latin stories, they were the same stories. The same stories of Roman heroes doing virtuous things because it was the right and noble thing to do. And not even an appeal to the gods, just this is what's right, this is what good boys and girls do. Um, and I think this is one of the, I and mean, I think Rachel hit it pretty squarely. If you read our founding fathers, they did not like the Greeks. They did not like Greek democracy. They thought it was horrible. Mm -hmm. But they loved the Romans. And so we have a Senate, mm -hmm. which was a, a Roman form of government. Um, a lot of the words. We, we have a republic, res publica, thing, mm -hmm. the things that are public. And um, American um, political history has made a big deal over, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Well, that's true as far as it goes. And it's a good thing to remind people of. Rachel, didn't you write a paper once dealing with when we started calling ourselves a democracy? Probably I, in high school. I think it was in high school, and it therefore is very, very far <laughs> back in my memory. 
Um, but I believe, I mean, it was in the, tw- I believe it was the 20th century before that became a common term yeah. uh, in our country. Is it along with World War One making the world safe for democracy? Democracy, yeah, it was just before I think that. It, it was, yeah, somewhere around that time where that became kind of a, a new buzzword uh, mm-hmm. that had not previously been been used. No, much. because for a democracy, every man gets one. Every voting citizen of <laughs> age who's a landholder, and I'm not a slave or an outsider who has citizenship. Let's eliminate everything here. Who's a male? Um, gets one vote, but to exercise that one vote, you have to be present where everybody's discussing the issue. It is the rule of the majority, 50% plus one. Uh, And if you can't get everybody together in the same room, you don't have a democracy. You have something else. The creation of uh, television and radio, now the internet, gives us the impression that, oh, we can get around that now because we can all be in the room virtually. It's not the same thing. (laughs) Not remotely the same thing, but our generation has been brainwashed into thinking it is, and that we've always been a democracy. The but the problem going the other direction is um, conservatives. I'm thinking here particularly of people like the John Birch Society and even some of our Christian friends in um, is in America great circles have also gone down this path that simply having a republic over democracy automatically guarantees us a so much better government and so much better freedom. Um, the things that make up a republic are you can have representative government and therefore you can have a much bigger population, a much larger territory, and you have fixed written laws that can't be altered. Now, those are slightly better than a democracy, but we need to understand that just as the Greek democracy came out of a demonic society, the Roman Republic came out of a demonic society. Mm -hmm. These are different versions of pagan governments. And although we can distinguish the one from the other, uh, simply adopting some outward forms ain't going to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And wasting all our time trying to reassert America as a republic is is not the solution here. What America needs is Christ. Mm-hmm. However, Christ may choose to manifest political reign where there have been Christian monarchies and Christian um, village communities and uh, Christian empires. And, you know, the, the weak link in all of them is this thing called man and sin. Right. <laughs> yeah. None it's of these a, forms of government are infallible. No. Nor are they meant to be. <laughs> They are all, all are extremely limited, and to define America as Christian because of her form of government is to misunderstand a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it is easier to appropriate Roman uh, culture and virtue, shall we say, than Greek, because the Romans were so practical as a people. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and like you said, mm-hmm. the stories. A story is a good story is a good story, man. I mm-hmm. want to hear about Horatio at the <laughs> gate. Um, just like I want to hear Sleeping Beauty and Snow White. Um, and it's not that there's, you know, they're not the gospel, but they sure are good stories. And you can turn <laughs> them to different purposes. <laughs> and, and and often do. Along those lines, there's a quote I have from uh, Will Durant. He and his wife wrote a multi-volume series in the history of Western civilization, which I do recommend, and I understand historians generally don't, because Durant's a storyteller, (laughs) um, and therefore not a scholar by their standards. But he says this of Rome. In summary, the typical educated Roman of this age was orderly, conservative, loyal, sober, reverent, tenacious, severe, practical. He enjoyed discipline and would have no nonsense about liberty. He obeyed as training for command. He took it for granted that the government had a right to inquire into his morals as well as his income, and to value him purely according to his services to the state. He distrusted individuality and genius. He had none of the charm, vivacity, and unstable fluency of the Attic Greek. He admired character and will as the Greeks admired freedom and intellect, and organization was his forte. He lacked imagination even to make a mythology of his own. He could with some effort love beauty, but he could seldom create it. He had no use for pure science and was suspicious of philosophy as a devilish dissolvent of ancient beliefs and ways. He could not for the life of him understand Plato or Archimedes or Christ. He could only rule the world. (laughs) Um, And a quote from Virgil from the Aeneid, But thou, O Roman... Learn with sovereign sway to rule the nations. Thy great art shall be to keep the world in lasting peace, 
to spare the humbled foe and crush to earth the proud. And I think those are good, I, good samplings of what uh, Roman character and thought and life form a kingly people. were all about. Yes. Oh, very much so. Not prophetic or priestly in, in <laughs> biblical senses, even remotely. One other thing that fits in with all of this, um, as Rome began to interact with other nations, she realized um, fairly early that other nations had laws that weren't hers. And if you're going to get one, the great genius of Rome, really, at least in, in terms of uh, public relations and world conquest, was it treated each conquered nation differently. It looked at the genius, and by the way, genius is, again, a Roman concept, the spirit, the force, the magical power inherent in the institution. They look at the genius of each nation and say, what, is, what do you want? What, can we, what deal can we cut with you? You can be our slaves. You can be our partners. You can be our brothers. You can be people who work for us. You can be people who get taxed. You can have Roman citizenship. What what deal is gonna is gonna cement our relationship here and cause us the least trouble while guaranteeing us the power to come and go, get tax money, and have people for armies? Uh, and so, in that respect, this was this was Roman genius. Um, again, the sense of their way of looking at the world, something that every other nation said, "Do it our way," or "That's that." Rome said, we'll, 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 we'll work with you here. In the process, they had, they, as they looked at other laws, they realized that there's going to be some disputes and differences. We do things this way to us, that makes perfect sense, but you do it that way for religions of your own weird culture. We don't want to go there. We don't want to mess with that. So we're going to set up a judge whose sole function is to balance out, mix, coordinate the laws of Rome with the laws of all of these individual nations. We want a common law of nations, as it were, a natural law common to all uh, that we can access by practical trial and error and by reason uh, that will fill out an empire. And so we have the first practical glimmerings of what will become natural law. The simple realization that Law is religious, and we got a lot of religions, so mm -hmm. we got to make this work somehow. Here's we're going to set apart a guy just to do that. It's such a big job. <laughs> uh, and there, and, I'm afraid we must wrap up. I, I was about to say, yeah. and <laughs> this is a good place because we go through a bunch of kings, and then we change to the republic. And at that point, there are many other things to say. I suspect next time it will be from the republic. It'll be the life of the republic to the coming of Caesar. And then we'll we'll see what we can do with that. Sounds good. So, uh, Emily, what's your recommendation? My recommendation is going to be the book Going Postal by Terry Pratchett. Ah. It's a novel of Discworld. Uh, I forget what made me think of it uh, in this context, but it seemed appropriate. And I'm sure if you read it and enjoy it, you will find out why. Oh, you know what? It was the uh, it was the oddly specific gods. Because ah. in this fictional world, there's a shrine to the goddess of things that get stuck in drawers so that you can't open them. <laughs> <laughs> quite humorous and quite, uh, uh, quite on the nose for Roman culture. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure that's humorous where Rome's concerned. That's exactly <laughs> the kind of gods they had. Wow. Because I, I, want, I wanted to talk to the god of, of stolen pens. <laughs> it goes right next to the goddess of stolen socks and then the one of stolen spoons. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, we have had a rash of each of these in turn and no explanations. It's the Why? cats. It's got to be the cats. Yeah, I'm <laughs> not so sure. About Maybe the socks. Okay. Uh, I'm going to recommend a book, not because it's the greatest book ever written, but because it summarizes a lot of material about Rome really quickly. It's a fairly short book. You usually find it as a used paperback. It's simply called The Romans. It's by R.H. Barrows. It was published in uh, 1949. As I say, it's a, it's a small, um, small paperback, well-organized, easily readable. And most Christians will not have a problem with it until they get to the section that involves Christianity. Because the guy doesn't like Christians. But if you can you know, <laughs> skip the last couple chapters and just or blow past them, his his study of Roman culture and society is well done, laid out, quick, specific to the point. Cool. Rachel? 
So mine's a little different. Um, I am going to recommend meditating on Ecclesiastes 7 because <laughs> you did it this last week in Bible study and uh, David and I have brought it up to each other more than a dozen times uh, just in the last few days. Um, even right after Bible study, we had a very good discussion over the particular verses of be not over much uh, righteous mm-hmm. or over much wicked and thinking, you, t- you know, most people tend to be more towards one or more towards the other. Are we always trying to get away with things uh, <laughs> or are we always overly fastidious about things? Um And what silly things are we overly fastidious about in our case? Uh, But also just the way that Solomon reminds us that God purposefully does not do things the way we expect so that we will never feel that we have control Mm -hmm. and we can figure out what God is doing. Um, So even in, for example, the election that's going on right now, it's so easy to be like, oh, I can see exactly what God is doing and he's going to do this, this and this. We really have no idea. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't need to be trying to figure out all out. God knows what he's doing. And so we've just benefited so much from that chapter in the last few days. So I'm going to recommend that to, to our praise, listeners. Praise God. One of my favorite chapters and in our mm-hmm. house also much referenced. <laughs> <laughs> One verse of Ecclesiastes that comes off into my mind is chapter 12, verse 12, where it says of learning in books, there's no end. <laughs> it's like, just, much, just stop. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight, and I look forward to digging into the Roman Republic with you next time. Uh, big thank you to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Uh, And thank you to you for listening. Uh, If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can, I was going to say visit our website, which I guess is a thing you can do. It's anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. It's been a while since I said our website. Um, I didn't know we had one. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you if we could have one. Uh, we have one. It's, (laughs) it's mostly just all of the podcast episodes. There's nothing else like (laughs) That you know, okay, that's what we'll, we do. We'll, it's we'll, exactly we'll what it says on the tin. All right, we'll talk about that. Later. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to get in touch with us, send us an email. Uh, you can do that with halting towards Zion at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.